Okay, uh, so uh, so I've given talks at uh, uh, meetings like this about uh, complexity in ADS-CFT, complexity in firewalls. So uh, for uh, for this meeting on uh, complexity in high energy physics, which uh, I'm uh, uh, delighted to be at, but I thought that I would talk about uh, something which is really, really, really high energy, uh, uh, high enough energy to. Uh, you know, uh, bend space-time into a closed time-like curve. Uh, and uh, also about really, really, really complex problems, uh, so complex that they're actually uncomputable uh, in, in the Turing sense. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, I do have uh, PowerPoint slides for uh, this uh, CTC talk, but, uh, but I made them tomorrow, so... So... Uh, so um, uh, so look, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 closed time like curves have been discussed in you know physics for generations. Uh, uh, Gödel's uh, present to Einstein on his 70th birthday was a, uh, uh, a CTC solution of uh, uh, general relativity, uh, and you know since then you know people have uh, studied a lot. You know under what conditions. Uh, could you make a, a, a CTC, you know, in classical GR from, say, a space-time that doesn't contain one initially? Uh, 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 Kip Thorne and others uh, uh, studied that. Uh, the answer, you know, seems to be that you need a, 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 um, um, uh, some some sort of material with negative energy density. Uh, uh, so that's that's problematic, uh, but you know, but you know, all of that is just uh, in classical physics, and then in you know, a, a quantum gra whether there could be CTCs in quantum gravity raises a whole uh, additional set of issues. Uh, uh, so we're not really going to talk about those. Um, we're going to just uh, uh, talk about uh, a question that, that I've been interested in for for a decade or so, which is uh, supposing that closed time like curves did exist, uh, how would they change the theory of computation? Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and this, is, this is something where I, I think we, you know, we, 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 we actually can learn something interesting. Uh, so, uh, so, so everyone's uh, first idea for a uh, closed time like curve computer is, oh, well, well, you know, of course that makes everything easy to solve because you just do an arbitrarily long computation and then you get the answer and then you send it back in time to before you even started. So you're, you're done. Okay. Uh, I think that there were, there were two main problems with that uh, uh, idea, that approach. Okay. Uh, problem number one is that, uh, well, it's, uh, uh, it's sort of like, you know, like maxing out your credit card and then just sort of not worrying that you're going to have to pay the bill later, right? It's like, you know, you're like, oh, you're still going to have to do this massive amount of computation, right? It's just that you're going to have to do it later. So, uh, so I think that, uh, uh, you know, even, even in a world with CTCs, we should still try to quantify resources, you know, and see, you know, look at the total resources that are being spent, that are being expended, you know, and see if they're, they're better than, than they were without CTCs. Okay, uh, but the second, you know, an even more fundamental issue is that uh, we have not yet uh, taken seriously, you know, the central conceptual problem of closed time-like curves, which, of course, is the grandfather paradox, right? You know, that's... Uh, I'll, you know, assume that we've all, you know, uh, seen enough science fiction to know that, you know, that's the thing where you go back in time, you kill your grandfather, therefore you're not born, therefore no one kills your grandfather, therefore you are born, and so on, you know, right? So, okay, uh, so, so, you know, in the, in the present context, the question would be, you know, what if you program your computer to go back to the beginning of the computation and just turn itself off? Right or not run, right? Then you know what happens. Okay, it's clear that you know in in in, in order to even talk sensibly about these sorts of questions, we need some you know clear mathematical definition of what a CTC computer is, you know, and what it, what happens with it in arbitrary situations, including situations you know involving uh, an apparent causality paradox. Okay, so. Um, uh, so, so uh, the you know the the study of of these you know 
uh, uh, sorts of questions of you know, uh, uh, computation with CTCs, I think really goes back to uh, 1991 or so when uh, David Deutsch uh, published a landmark paper uh, about uh, uh, quantum mechanics in the presence of, of closed time-like curves. Okay, and what Deutsch uh, proposed there uh, was that you know, we should think of a CTC uh, if it exists as just a region of space-time where nature is somehow uh, forced to find a fixed point of whatever evolution operator is acting uh, around the CTC. Okay, so, uh, so, so I have, you know, let's say, you know, some Hamiltonian or some physical evolution that acts in some region and uh, you know, implement some operator, you know, some operation, which I'll call S, and then uh, we, uh, we put a sort of condition that, that now uh, whatever is the state over here, call the state X, would well, better have the property that S of X equals S. Okay, because, you know, otherwise we would, we would have an inconsistency. Okay, and so then from, from this standpoint, well, the, the obvious problem is that not every operation has a fixed point, right? Uh, uh, you know, if we're doing deterministic computation. The, indeed, that's just a fancy way to restate the grandfather paradox, right? Like, what if X is a bit and S is the not operation? Okay, well, there, you know, well, there's, there's no solution here. Okay, so then uh, Deutsch's proposal was, well, we should use the fact that you know, the world is, is quantum mechanical, okay? So even if we just went to classical probability theory, right, it is a well-known theorem that uh, in finite dimensions, uh, uh, every Markov chain or every, every stochastic uh, operation has at least one stationary distribution, right? So we could say at any rate, there will be some probability distribution D over states which will be left invariant by applying our, our operation. So for example, uh, if we had the not gate, uh, which is this, well then its unique fixed point is just the uniform distribution. Okay, so uh, in the context of the grandfather paradox, this is just saying, well, you're born with probability half, if you're born, then you go back in time and you kill your grandfather. Therefore, you're born with probability half, and so on. Everything's consistent. There's no paradox, right? Uh, okay, and, and this, this fact about stationary distributions, you know, has a, a, a natural generalization to mixed states. Okay, so if S is a super operator, uh, you know, a general quantum operation, uh, it will always be the case that there is at least one uh, density matrix rho such that S of rho equals rho. Okay, again, in, in assuming finite dimensions, okay, which, which will be important later. Okay, so, uh, um, you know, by the way, you know, it, it's not always true that there's a pure state. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, 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 it, you know, it will be true for, you know, you could, you could, you could, you could do the cut at any point you wanted. Right. But, uh, um, so, so, okay. So the, the, the model of computation uh, uh, with, with CTCs that Deutsch proposed is basically, you know, we consider a computer with two different registers. Um, you know, let's, let's think of it as a, as a quantum computer. So, uh, firstly, we have what's called a causality respecting register, uh, CR, right? And these are just uh, qubits that, you know, that we initialize in some state that we want, and then we can measure them at the end, okay? So, you know, we think of ourselves as external to the closed time-like curve, right? We're just, you know, uh, you know, like, like in the middle of your computer, there might be a black hole, there might be a closed time white curve, but we, the users, are perfectly ordinary, okay? We feed in an input, we, get, we read an output, okay? And then there are also these CTC qubits. Um, well, and these are the ones for which we impose this uh, causal consistency condition, 
Okay, and then we get to apply a quantum circuit of our choice, you know, inside of the CTC. So we can apply, you know, a sequence of quantum gates, you know, on these qubits, which might involve interaction between uh, the two registers. Okay, and then, um, uh, 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 and, 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 you know, we, we will we'll, uh, account for resources the same way we would in any quantum computation. Okay, so we'll say, you know, this, should, this ought to be a polynomial size quantum circuit. Okay, so polynomial number of quantum gates. And then uh, uh, the, the induced action of this, you know, on the uh, uh, CTC qubits alone will give rise to some super operator acting on the CTC qubits, right? Because of the interaction with the causality respecting qubits, it need not be unitary, right? So yeah. you generate a real causality violating system? Uh, well, we, well I'm, I'm explaining the model, right? So, so you, 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 yes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't done this in the lab, okay? <laughs> if that's your question, okay? All right. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, supposing that you had a closed time-like curve that followed Deutsch's formalism, this is what you would do. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, by hypothesis, you know, nature is sort of forced to find some uh, uh, fixed point rho uh, 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 for for the CTC register, and so then we we'll ju we just imagine that whatever is that fixed point, sort of rho is what gets fed in at the appropriate point in the CTC, and then you know because of the interaction, when I go make a measurement on the causality respecting qubits, the outcome of that measurement can depend on rho, and I can actually learn something about that fixed point. Okay, and uh, that is the, uh, the, the source of the potential power here. Okay, now, uh, you know, an, an immediate, uh, 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 well, you know, I mean, I mean, people have, you know, have had a lot of problems with this, okay, but, but one problem that you might have is, well, what if there are multiple fixed points? Uh, you know, so, so uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know the, like, like, you know, it's only guaranteed that there will be at least one, right, but there could be many. Okay, so, so this is what would happen in uh, what I call the grandfather anti-paradox. That's where you go back in time and you introduce your grandfather to your grandmother. Okay, I think, you know, wasn't that like the Back to the Future movie? Okay, but, you know, so then, you know, so, so like there are two perfectly consistent solutions, right? One where you're born and you go back and you cause yourself to be born, and another one where you're not born, and so you don't cause yourself to be born, right? Uh, but which, which solution we have is not determined by the boundary conditions, you know, you know of, of physics, which, which you might find to be problematic, right? Uh, but... Um, for the purposes of computation, uh, we can simply say that if, uh, whenever there are multiple fixed points, uh, nature is allowed to choose one of them adversarially, right? So, you know, we'll just imagine that nature can choose one to make whatever computation we're trying to do as hard as possible for us, and we'll try to show that even, even under that assumption that we could still solve a hard problem. Yeah? Uh, it might be. Uh, well, no, it, it, it might be. I mean, I mean, I, in fact, I'll give examples where even a row that is a pure state, you know, the ability to find that pure state could give you enormous computational power, right? I just, you know, I, I have to uh, make it a mixed state in order to guarantee that it will always exist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but sh shortly I'll give an example where you get lots of computational power and it happens that row is, is, is pure. Okay. So, uh, okay. So now, you know, the, you know, in, intuitively this, you know, forcing nature to find a fixed point. Well, for one thing, it breaks the linearity of quantum mechanics and it should be no surprise if it gives us a lot of computational power, right? And, you know, the a story that people tell uh, uh, to uh, give the intuition for that is called the, the Shakespeare paradox. Okay. This is where you go back in time to William Shakespeare, you uh, say, you know, uh, let's say, you know, the young Shakespeare, and you say, listen, I'm going to save you some time. I'm going to just give you this complete works of Shakespeare, so you know you don't have to write anything. He says, man, wow, this is awesome. Thanks for saving me all this work. And then he just publishes those, 
and they, you know, they uh, go down in history, you know, and they, and they come to you, and so then you bring them back, and so on. Now, notice that unlike with the grandfather paradox, there is no logical inconsistency here, right? It is a completely consistent story, okay? The only par but yeah, the only paradox, if you like, is one of computational hardness, you know, which is some, somehow Macbeth pops into existence uh, without anyone ever having done the work of writing it. Okay, uh, so now in a, in a more uh, computer science context, uh, we could... We could imagine... Uh, Let's say that uh, phi is uh, 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 an instance of the three sat problem, right? Or, or whatever is your favorite NP complete problem, right? Just some really hard combinatorial search problem. Okay, in this case, you know, I'm looking for a setting of these n Boolean variables that will cause this formula to be satisfied, right? And, you know, and you know, like like any pro breaking any crypto system, proving any m mathematical theorem by, you know, a proof of bounded size and so forth can all be encoded as, 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 this, as this problem. Okay, well, um, how, how could I solve this problem using a CTC computer? All right, well, I'll give you a very simple algorithm for it. Uh, so, so I'll define a polynomial size circuit, which would be acting inside of the uh, closed time-like curve. And all it's going to do is it's going to take, so we'll assume that, that in, in from, you know, in these closed time-like curve bits comes an n-bit string x, which represents a candidate satisfying assignment uh, to this formula. And then we say, if, uh, I'll just write some pseudocode, if x satisfies phi, then we're happy, so we send x back, okay, with no change. Otherwise, uh, we send back uh, the lexicographically next string uh, looping around after we reach the last one. So I'll call that x plus 1 mod 2 to the n. Okay, and now we can just think about what this will do. Well, you know, uh, 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 by assumption, nature has to find a fixed point of this evolution operator, right? So, so, so if phi has one or more satisfying assignments, then it's clear that the only fixed points of this evolution will be uh, concentrated on those assignments, right? You know, nothing else is a fixed point, okay? If, uh, if phi has no satisfying assignments, then what will the fixed point be? Yeah, yeah, in that case it will just be uniform, but in that case we don't really care either, okay? So if, if phi is satisfiable, then just by observing the state of the CTC register, we read out a satisfying assignment, right? So, uh, so that's how, you know, uh, you know, I think that this was implicit in Deutsch's paper, right? You know, this is how uh, this model could solve NP-complete problems, okay? So... <laughs> Or a way that I can get this to stop flopping around. Uh, ah, thanks. It's not obvious to me, though. <laughs> I don't think it's working. Uh, all right, I'll just deal with it. Okay, so. Um, uh, a decade ago, uh, John Watrous and I were interested in the question of, you know, well, well, what is the ultimate limit of what you could do in this model? You know, is it just NP-complete problems? Is it even more than that? Uh, okay, so we had a paper about it in 2008, and so we said, you know, we could let... PCTC, polynomial time with closed time-like curves, be the set of all the problems that you could solve, you know, uh, using, using this, you know, th th this model with a classical computation in the closed time-like curve. Uh, but, you know, because we're, you know, uh, uh, um, 
you know, you know, we're, we're trying to make contact with physics for some definition of physics, you know, we might as well consider a quantum computer inside of a closed time-like curve as well. That would give rise to a class that we called BQP, CTC. So everything you could do in quantum bounded error quantum polynomial time, uh, uh, you know, with a, a quantum with a polynomial size quantum circuit inside of your your CTC. Okay, so what's the power of these classes? Is this one even more powerful than that one? Uh, so the main result that we showed then was that actually this class equals that one uh, equals uh, p space which is just the class of problems that I could solve on a conventional computer using a polynomial amount of memory, but possibly an exponential amount of time. Okay, so this is, you know, believed to be a much larger class even than, uh, than NP, right? You know, on the other hand, it's not like, you know, infinitely larger, right? It's, uh, you know, so, so, so this is saying, first of all, that, you know, yes, you can do a huge amount with, you know, CTCs, no, no surprise there. There is a limit to what you could do, even with a polynomial time computation inside of a CTC, and maybe surprisingly, in the presence of CTCs, a quantum computer is no more useful than a classical computer, okay? The CTC just kind of obliterates that distinction, okay? So, um, so, so how did we solve um, p-space problems uh, using a CTC? Uh, so um, the idea, this, uh, this was um, relied on an observation of Lance Fortnow, uh, but uh, the basic idea is that, you know, well, you know, you imagine some polynomial space computation that you want to simulate using your CTC computer. So, so now, you know, I'll imagine that what gets fed into the CTC register is a configuration of the, the uh, uh, algorithm that I'm trying to simulate, plus uh, next to it an answer bit, which could be either zero or one, okay, for, for reject or accept, right? And that's the bit that we're trying to decide, like the bit that this p-space computation would produce at, at, the, at the very end, okay? And now the rule, is that, um, you know, if I am not at a halt state of my computation, you know, then I, then I just feed back into the closed time like curve, you know, the next step of the computation, right, while leaving the uh, answer bit, whatever it was before, okay? But if I am at a halting state of the computation, then I go back to the very beginning of the computation while also setting the answer bit to whatever value it's supposed to have. Okay, so let's say without loss of generality that the answer bit is supposed to be one, like this computation accepts. Then this state would get mapped to that state and this state would get also mapped to this state, okay? And uh, any state that's not a valid state of the computation will just get mapped to the beginning somewhere, like that. Okay, so now we ask, what are the fixed points of this evolution? And what, 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 what's a fixed point here, anyone? Well, yeah, yeah, there's only one fixed point, and it's just uniform over all the steps of the computation, but with the answer bit having been set to its correct value. Okay, so, um, so the more interesting part was, uh, 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 in, in our paper, was actually how do you show that even a quantum computer with access to a closed time-like curve can be simulated in p-space, okay? And so for that, uh, we needed to use um, uh, an operation that, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm defining a closed time like curve as a resource that finds a fixed point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, so the key is, um, let me, let me give this a different name. Let me call this like uh, uh, 
phi. Okay, so, so suppose I have a super operator S, then uh, I define this operation here. Uh, you know, so I can define a, a new super operator like this as this limit of, you know, this multiplying term, you know, times this Taylor series, okay? And this has the very useful property that it projects onto the fixed points of S. Okay, you know, that's something that one can verify. That's actually a nice way to prove that, that S has a fixed point, you know, at all, right? It's just to construct this operator. Okay, but now what this does is it reduces the problem of simulating a closed time-like curve quantum computer to the problem of implementing this operator, right? And now what, what we can do is we can use, um, uh, you, know, it, it's, it's, you know, it's actually known how to do linear algebra on exponentially large matrices uh, sort of implicitly in p-space using only polynomial memory. So we can take uh, algorithms for small, you know, linear algebra with small memory that were developed in the 1980s, such as a Chankey's algorithm for inverting a matrix. Uh, we have to, you know, make them work in this algebraic setting where you're taking a limit, and you know, and you know, but we we do all of that, and you get a, basically a p-space algorithm to implement this operator and thereby project onto the fixed points of your closed time-like curve. Uh, you know, and, and then you can, you can calculate whether they lead to acceptance or rejection. Okay, so that's the idea there. Now, uh, what happened um, a couple of years ago is that uh, Giulio uh, uh, Gueltrini, uh, who was an undergrad, uh, just walked into my office uh, unannounced at, at MIT. I was still at MIT then. And, uh, he, sa and he, he said, listen, uh, I want to know, can closed time-like curve solve the halting problem? Okay, and you know, I look and I'm like, well, let me, let me explain. See, Watrous and I had this paper. We proved that CTCs only let you do p-space. Let me explain what p-space is. It's big, but it's a lot, lot smaller than the halting problem, you know, which is all the way up in, you know, uncomputable uh, land. And, uh, and, and he said, uh, you know, I, I know, I read your paper. Uh, my question was, uh, what if there is no bound on the number of bits that can go inside of the CTC? Okay, so I have a Turing machine that can, let's say, that can act, you know, on, you know, inside of my CTC. I require that, you know, each state that it, each input and output state of the Turing machine consists of only a finite number of bits, but there's no, you know, uniform bound on, on that number, right? Uh, you know, then could I uh, solve the halting problem, which, by the way, is just the problem of deciding whether an arbitrary you know, whether a given program halts or not, you know, on, on a blank input, the most famous example of an uncomputable problem. Okay, so I said, well, I don't, I don't think that your model even makes sense because now you have a closed time-like curve acting on an infinite dimensional state space, and in that situation, there need not even exist fixed points in general, right? So let's consider the following situation, that I have an operation C, uh, with acting inside a CTC, which takes his input an encoding of a positive integer n, and which outputs the encoding of positive integer n plus one. Okay, you could say this is the grandfather paradox on steroids. Okay, because this not only is there no you know consistent you know solution you know is is there no uh, uh, deterministic fixed point of this equation, there's not even a probabilistic fixed point, right? So, you know, so, ha so, 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 ha so how do we even think about this? Okay, so, so Julio said, well, uh, you know, then, 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 then let's say we just assume that the, you know, that the operation that we're given does have a fixed point, okay? We're, we're promised that it has one. Then, you know, uh, can, you know, can finding that fixed point be, you know, as hard as solving the halting problem? Okay, so now we had a question. And the answer to it turns out to be yes. Uh, uh, that, that, uh, that by finding the fixed point of, uh, you know, a general Turing machine map, uh, you can solve the halting problem. Uh, so let me... Um, show you the algorithm to do that. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know the, 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 the trick is a little bit interesting. Why is 
Well, um, you know, we're, 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 we're just going to impose the promise that a, that a fixed point exists. So, so, so if you like, we're going to uh, just assume causality. You know, we're going to assume that there is a consistent solution, and we're going to ask about the hardness of finding it. Okay. So here's what we do. So let's say that we're given a program P, so, you know, such that we want to decide whether P halts. Okay, like you know, maybe P searches for counterexamples to the Riemann hypothesis and halts as soon as it finds one. You know, something simple like that. Okay, so, so then here, here's going to be, you know, what I, what I do inside of the CTC. Uh, it's going to, uh, I'm going to take in the CTC register um, a non-negative integer T that represents a number of steps you know, of, of, uh, of execution. And then, basically, we're just inside of the CTC, I'm going to run P for T steps, uh, up to T steps, and see what happens. Okay? Now, if P halts in exactly T steps, then I'm happy, I, say, I just send back T, okay? Uh, if P halts in fewer than T steps, then I just send back zero, okay? So it's like I go back to the beginning, okay? And the most interesting case is if P runs for more than T steps, so like it hasn't halted by within t steps, then I send back t plus one or zero with equal probability. Okay, so now we once again ask, what are the fixed points of this evolution? You know, do, do they even exist? Okay, so let's first suppose that p does halt in some number of steps t. In that case, what are the fixed points? Anyone see? t. Yeah, if p halts in t steps, then the unique fixed point is just t, t goes in and t comes out. Okay? That's the only fixed point here. Okay, but now suppose that p runs forever. Uh, in that case, what's the fixed point? Yes. If p runs forever, then the only fixed point is with half probability zero comes in, with a quarter probability one, with an eighth probability two, and so forth. So it's a geometric series, you know, over all possible numbers of steps, right? And, you know, and if you like this probabilistic uh, 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 branching over here has ensured that even in the run forever case, there will still be a fixed point. Okay, in this case, this one. Okay, so, um, so you know, you might ask, in, in what sense have we made the halting problem decidable, right? Because there's, you know, it feels like in some sense there's still an unbounded amount of computation that, that, that happens here. Okay, but what we've done, if you like, right, there, you know, if, if a program halts, then there's always a finite certificate, you know, for that fact, which is just, you know, the number of steps that it takes, right, or, or like a, a trace of its execution that, that shows that, it's halt, that it halts, right? The difficulty of the halting problem is that, you know, if a program runs forever, then in general there is no finite witness of that fact, right? If there were, then the halting problem would be solvable. Okay, but in this CTC setting, you know, there is a finite witness, or at least a witness with expected finite length, even expected very small length, you know, even for the, for the case that the program runs forever. Okay, so that, 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 that's what this accomplished. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, so now the main theorem that, uh, that, we, that we proved in the, you know, and, and this is, I should mention, this is a, uh, 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 this, this computability paper, this is, this is from about a year ago. You can find it on the archive. Uh, you know. Uh, 
for some reason, they didn't make us send it to Vixra. Uh, okay. Uh, so the main theorem that, that we prove is, uh, okay, you can, you, can, you can think of, you know, the set of all problems that are computable in the presence of a closed time-like curve. You can think of all the things that are computable with a, a quantum Turing machine inside of a closed time-like curve. All right, and you can ask, what are you know, these two classes? And again, is this one stronger than this one? Okay, our main theorem is that this equals this equals uh, the set of all problems that are computable with an oracle for the halting problem. Okay, so, so in other words, uh, even in this world with unbounded size closed time-like curves, well, okay, you can do the halting problem, but in some sense, not that much more than the halting problem. Right, that's, that's kind of the ceiling of what you can do. And interestingly, uh, uh, you know, have, having a quantum computer doesn't change what you can do. Right, I should mention, you know, usually it's obvious that, you know, going from classical computing to quantum computing is not going to change what's computable. Right, it merely changes, you know, what is, you know, you know, the amount of time that it takes to compute something. Right, that's, you know, something I'll, I'll say in like, you know, or very early in an, in, a, in an undergrad class, you know, on, on quantum computing. Okay, but in the closed time-like curve setting, well, it, it also turns out to be true, but it, but it requires a new proof, right? Because, you know, maybe finding the fixed points of quantum evolutions would somehow be harder than finding the fixed points of classical ones. Okay, so, um, so how do we prove this? Well, we can generalize the algorithm that I gave before to actually solve anything in this class which computability theorists call a delta two, but it just means whatever is computable with an oracle for the halting problem, okay? Uh, you know, the more interesting part is even if I have a quantum Turing machine acting inside of a closed time-like curve, how can I simulate that using merely an oracle for the halting problem and, and no more? Okay. And this is where the, you know, the kind of uh, uh, interesting math came in to our, to our new paper, right? Uh, you know, analogously, to, you, know, where the, you know, the upper bound was the interesting part of, of the old paper. Okay, so, um, um, so, so basically, um, you know, the, 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 the situation is that you know we need to take some CTC Turing machine, you know, which which applies some operation M, let's say uh, inside of the CTC, and which we assume has uh, uh, at least one fixed point. Okay, and now what, what what I need to do in this computable to the halt is I need to actually find a fixed point of M. Okay, uh, you know, I'll assume that either all of the fixed points lead to accepting with high probability or else all of the fixed points lead to rejecting with high probability, right? Which means it suffices for me to just find any fixed point, you know, of this uh, uh, um, uh, um, a, a super operator acting on a countably infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, that's all I got to do. So, uh, so what I do is, um, all right, well, let's first observe that if I uh, restricted to just like a finite part of this Hilbert space, like let's say the set of all n-bit strings, right, then it would be easy to give a countable set of, uh, of, of mixed states that, that sort of densely covers, you know, the set of all mixed states, you know, over this set. Right, for example, I could consider all of the mixed states, you know, where, where all of the matrix entries are rational numbers. Right, that would be a countable set. Okay, I'd call it S sub n. Okay, but now that means that I could also take the union of that over every n, and that, and that will contain um, arbitrarily close approximations to every mixed state over uh, the set of all strings, you know, of whatever length. Right, so, so I can get or, you know, so, so just by looping over all of the elements of S, right, I can get arbitrarily close to any possible candidate fixed point that there could be, 
right? Which, you know, because, you know, of course, whatever the fixed point is, right, it might have support over infinitely many strings, but it has to be a normalized quantum state, right? So, you know, so I could get, I can get arbitrarily close in this way. Okay, and then, so the idea is I'm going to just do that. I'm going to just start enumerating all of the elements of S one by one. And then for each one, um, say, uh, for each uh, sigma in S, uh, I now uh, can uh, sort of use my halt oracle, use my oracle for the halting problem in order to check whether, okay, let's say I, I computed m of sigma, m of m of sigma, m of m of sigma, and so forth. Uh, as I kept doing this, would I ever get far from sigma? Let's say in the trace distance metric. Or would I always stay close to sigma, right? Uh, and, you know, in that way, I'm going to try to figure out whether I'm close to a fixed point or not. Okay, now one direction of this is, is quite easy to see. Okay, so suppose that a sigma is very close to some uh, state rho such that m of rho equals rho. Okay, well then, uh, then it's easy to see that as a consequence, you know, um, uh, for every t, m to the t of sigma is going to be close to sigma. Okay, so then, you know, my algorithm will, will, will yes, it will stop there and it will say here is a candidate fixed point. Okay, uh, the more interesting part is the converse direction. Okay, so suppose Suppose it's true that no matter how many times I apply m, you know, to sigma, I always stay close to sigma, right? Which I could check using an oracle for the halting problem, okay? Uh, in that case, must sigma be close to an actual fixed point, uh, rel, of, of, of m, okay? Uh, so, um, okay, so this was not obvious to us, but we were able to prove that the answer is yes, using some tools from functional analysis. In particular, we need this thing called the Rees representation theorem uh, that uh, applies uh, uh, for, you know, Hilbert spaces, uh, you, know, you know, even of, of infinite dimension and, you know, that have a continuous dual and, all right, there's all kinds of math jargon that goes into it. But, uh, uh, you know, but you can, you can, you can show that, that, that this sort of implication does hold, which means that once you terminate with a, you know, with a, with a, um, uh, a sigma that looks like this, which by the assumption that fixed points exist, you will eventually, then it actually is close to a fixed point. And so, and so then you're happy. Okay. So um, let me uh, just, just ma uh, make a few uh, final remarks. Okay, so um, first remark is, you know, you might wonder, well, well why, did, why, why, why does it stop here? Dude, you know, why, why, once we can get the halting problem, why can't we get even more than the halting problem, right? And just go all the way up through the, you know, the whole computability hierarchy, right? Or, you know, or the halting problem with oracles for the halting problem and so forth. Well, uh, you know, actually we could get that in a generalization of this model where you could have a CTC that is then able to sprout smaller CTCs inside of it. And then those CTCs could have smaller CTCs inside of them and so forth. In that model, you could get all the way up through the arithmetical hierarchy. Okay, uh, here, here as, as our theorem showed, you stop at the halting problem. Okay, now, you know, I should mention uh, for the sake of honesty that, you know, there have been uh, uh, many uh, objections raised against Deutsch's model of closed time-like curves. One of them was from a paper by uh, Charlie Bennett and uh, Debbie Leung and, and others where they pointed out that Deutsch's model, you know, among other things, uh, breaks the statistical interpretation of, of density matrices, right? So, like, if I fed a CTC computer a dist an equal distribution over two different inputs, there's no guarantee that I would get out an equal distribution over the corresponding answers. 
Okay, now my response to this was always, well, sort of like, you know, what do you want? It's a closed time-like curve. You know, of course it's going to break linearity. And, you know, uh, you know I mean, well, what's surprising is that you get a theory that's sort of as, you know, as mathematically nice as it is. Okay, uh, you know, there, there are alternative models of uh, computation with CTCs, including a model based on post-selection uh, due to uh, Seth Lloyd et al. Uh, we actually show in our paper that that yields a slightly smaller class of problems, namely all the problems that are non-adaptively reducible to an oracle for the halting problem. It's like all the halt queries have to be made in parallel. Okay, so you can still do the halting problem, but you know, but it's a little bit less than with Deutsch's model. Okay. Uh, okay. Now another objection uh, to this, uh, you know, this computation ideas, which was uh, uh, pointed out to me by the uh, philosopher of science Tim Maudlin, but which is actually also in Deutsch's original paper, is um, you know you might worry about the the problem of spurious fixed points. That is, you know, what if the laws of physics were such that, you know, when you tried to build a CTC computer, um, you know, nature would always have an out. Like, for example, you would find that the fixed point is always just, well, an asteroid hits your computer and destroys it. <laughs> okay? Well, you know, and that would be a fixed point of the sort of underlying, you know, physical theory that your computer was built out of, even though it would violate the abstraction boundaries that you thought that you would enforce when you, you know, when you built your circuit inside of the CTC. Right? So, you know, so I, I view this as actually a detailed question about the laws of physics. Namely, how, you know, for any given physical theory, the standard model or whatever it is, you can ask how much control do they actually give you over the microstate inside of your CTC. Um, you know, and, and if they give you enough control, then you can, solve, you know, you can implement these algorithms that I showed, but, but otherwise maybe not. Okay, you could worry about fault tolerance in this model, you know, because we want it to be practical. Okay, uh, so you know, uh, it's, it's easy to observe that if we had just, you know, small entry-wise errors in the super operator that we're applying and we didn't do any error correction, then we would be dead. Okay, a, a tiny change to the super operator can yield an enormous change in the fixed points. Okay, and that, 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 that's easy to see. Okay, but if we just do a little bit of error correction, then it seems like, you know, actually error correction works even in a CTC setting. So I could just receive, you know, a, 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 an encoded string from, you know, from the future, decode it, do a computation on it, re-encode it. And, you know, that, that appears to work. That was an observation originally due to Dave Bacon in 2003. Okay, so let me just conclude by saying, you know, does this challenge the Church-Turing thesis? You know, not just the polynomial time one, but the original computability thesis. You know, should we now go out and try to build CTC computers that solve the halting problem with finite resources? You know, or, you know, is this just an additional argument for why CTCs uh, shouldn't exist in our universe? Uh, or, you know, is it, you know, and, and you could think about, you know, can CTCs exist in ADS-CFT? What would they do to the boundary theory? You know, I think those are all interesting questions or maybe it's suggesting that CTCs maybe could exist, but if so, then uh, you know, the way that we modeled them or the way that Deutsch modeled them is wrong. Okay, so those are the questions that I leave to you. Thanks. <laughs>